Notwithstanding, thou mayest kill and eat flesh in all thy gates, whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee. The unclean and the clean may eat thereof, as of the roebuck and as of the heart. Only ye shall not eat the blood, ye shall pour it upon the earth as water. Thou mayest not eat within thy gates the tithe of thy corn, or of thy wine, or of thy oil, or the firstlings of thy herds, or of thy flocks, nor any of thy vows which thou vowest, nor thy freewill offerings, or heave offerings of thine hand, but thou must eat them before the Lord thy God in the place which the Lord thy God shall choose, thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy manservant and thy maidservant and the Levite that is within thy gates, and thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God in all that thou puttest thine hands unto. Take heed to thyself that thou forsake not the Levite as long as thou livest upon the earth. When the Lord thy God shall enlarge thy border, as he hath promised thee, and thou shalt say, I will eat flesh, because thy soul longeth to eat flesh, mm -hmm. thou mayest eat flesh whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. If the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen to put his name there be too far from thee, then thou shalt kill of thy herd and of thy flock which the Lord hath given thee as I have commanded thee, and thou shalt eat in thy gates whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. Even as the roebuck and the heart is eaten, so thou shalt eat them. The unclean and the clean shall eat of them alike. Only be sure that thou eat not the blood, for the blood is the life, and thou mayest not eat the life with the flesh. Thou shalt not eat it, Thou shalt pour it upon the earth as water. Thou shalt not eat it, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee, when thou shalt do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. Only thy holy things, which thou hast in thy vows, thou shalt take and go unto the place which the Lord shall choose. And thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, the flesh and the blood, upon the altar of the Lord thy God. And the blood of thy sacrifices shall be poured out upon the altar of the Lord thy God, and thou shalt eat the flesh. Observe and hear all these words which I command thee, that it may go well with thee, and with thy children after thee forever. When thou doest that which is good and right in the sight of the Lord thy God. When the Lord thy God shall cut off the nations from before thee, whither thou goest to possess them, and thou, shalt, and thou succeedest them and dwellest in their land, Take heed to thyself, thou be not snared by following them. After that they be destroyed from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God, for every abomination to the Lord, which he hateth, have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their gods. What thing soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. So again, we're contrasting in the first portion of this scriptures when God actually named the gathering place unto his people. Or at least proclaimed that he would be naming a specific place and what to do once you get there. God clearly gives several commands, repeats them often, and that's just an indication of the people he's dealing with. And honestly, that's an indication of us as he deals with us. Sometimes we have to hear things many times before we're going to get it. So here we're contrasting the gathering place, which had a purpose of being for the assembly, for offering, for giving, for worshiping, and for rejoicing. And the Bible says, with all thy people. In other words, sons, daughters, men servants, maid servants, the Levites, all were to come and gather unto this one place to fulfill the religious duties that God is about to set forth. If you go then to Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 15, he begins to transition into another topic. The place will be chosen. This is what's going to happen as far as sacrifice goes. This is who is to come and partake in these things. And he's going to continue on seemingly another topic, but it's interesting you'll find how these things actually tie together. 
verse 15, it says, Notwithstanding, thou mayest kill and eat flesh in all thy gates. So here, the gathering place was contrasted with every place, and the gates of the people are what he is actually contrasting here. So, your gathering place, your gates, two different things. The assembly, the offering, the giving, the worshiping, the rejoicing. And here he says, you may kill and eat in your gates. Kind of giving a, two different scenarios and two different things that would take place in the lives of these people. He's essentially dividing their religious life and the place of that setting from their home life or their gates, what's in their gates, and, and giving something for that setting as well. The second part of that, it says, Whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee, the unclean and the clean may eat thereof, as of the roebuck and as of the harp. So the blessing and the gift of God is given here, and it is an opportunity to kill and to eat whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. So when I read this, Immediately, I got a little bit confused because I understand and know, and we all do, I think, that there were dietary restrictions in the Old Testament. If you've read the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, you'll find them. Numbers, a little bit. And then now we're at Deuteronomy, the retelling of the law. So it's a little bit confusing then. Why is God here now saying, you may eat whatsoever thy soul lusteth after? And actually, I read it quickly, and I'm like, why is God saying eat the clean and the unclean? Well, he's actually not saying that. I got confused because I'm missing one word, and when I read it quickly, I was like, hey, why is God commanding to eat the unclean and the clean in this place? No, he's not doing that. He's actually saying the unclean people and the clean people may eat of what he's talking about here. So he's clearly said that there's a division here. There's something, there's a, there's a place where if you're ceremonially clean, you may go and do your religious rites and eat there. And then also there's this place that's just general for everybody. Now, when you were unclean, it wasn't because always of, of some sin that had happened. Sometimes people just approached unto uh, a dead body. Sometimes they did something um, that, wasn't, that wasn't the cleanest that day. Often there were stipulations given for changing the time of a certain religious rite or ceremony because the man found themselves unclean, whether by their own choices or not. Sometimes you just catch a bug and you become unclean. Sometimes you just uh, stumble across somebody that has passed away and you become unclean for a time. But God here is not confounding and get rid of the dietary restrictions when he says, whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. I missed when you look over in verse 22, it says, even as the roebuck and the heart is eaten, so shalt thou eat them. The unclean and the clean shall eat of them alike. He's not saying the unclean and the clean beasts ye shall eat alike. He's saying the unclean and the clean people shall eat of these roebucks and hearts alike. Whatever your soul lusteth after, whatever you're desiring to eat at that time. And if you go and study it out, the roebuck and the heart are clearly clean animals that were to be feasted upon and enjoyed and they were a gift from God. So now we find the divide is made. There is this inner chosen place that God sets forth for offering um, where the clean men would go and they could they could offer their sacrifices and their religious rites prepare themselves by being ceremonially and ritually pure before they enter in and then at that time they could eat in that chosen clean place and then there's this other place the outer gates which is basically just general eating purposes He's saying you're not only going to eat when you enter into the sanctuary, but you're going to be able to eat when you're in your own gates. And that's a good thing, especially because as we read in the context, there was a place that was too far for some of these people to go, being that place that God chose. When you have a whole nation, if God decides he's going to choose to put his place of worship over here, if you're over here, you're in a lot of trouble because it's a long place to go, especially if that's the only place that you could actually slay and eat beasts at. No, so God provides that these folks way over here within their own gates could eat, whether they were clean or unclean, they could eat of the beasts that were given, that were provided by God, that were ritually pure because they were clean beasts by definition. But whether you were clean or whether you weren't, you could have and partake of this meat. So sometimes clean and unclean was a sanitary thing. Sometimes clean and unclean was defined by a ceremonial reason. 
If you read verse 16, it says, Only ye shall not eat the blood thereof, ye shall pour it upon the earth as water. So certainly, if you were to look in, keep your finger in Deuteronomy chapter 12, and a few books back in Exodus chapter 12, you're going to find a definition of blood and what it actually means into the service of God. Exodus chapter 12, and in verse 21, the Bible says, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families, and kill the Passover, and ye shall take a bunch of hyssop, and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. So God here is highlighting the Passover. When the sacrifice was made, blood was put on the doorpost. At that time when Egypt was to lose all their firstborns, God promised protection to the people of God if they would just do this thing. And from that time on, you see that the blood is mentioned in reverence and in highly esteemed as something that is pure, set aside, and only for God. And so, that's why you see the people then commanded to pour it out upon the ground if they're in the case where they're eating in their own gates. Don't eat the blood. Pour it out upon the earth. For the, in the life is in the blood, the Bible says, in other places. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 12. And in verse 17 through 18, you're going to read, Thou mayest not eat within thy gates the tithe of thy corn, or of thy wine, or of thy oil, or the firstlings of thy herds, or of thy flock, nor any of thy vows which thou vowest, nor thy freewill offerings, or heave offerings of thine hand. But thou must eat them before the Lord thy God in the place which the Lord God shall choose, thou and thy sons and thy daughter and thy manservant and thy maidservant and the Levites within thy gates. Thou shalt rejoice before the Lord in all that thou puttest thine hand into. This here is a repeat and actually ties these two parts of the chapter together. It's a repeat of verse 6 through 7 and also verses 11 through 12. God is really driving the point home of verse 8 where it says, Ye shall not do after all the things that we do here this day, every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. God is indicating that there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So God is setting forth his way in his place and how his people ought to follow after and ought to serve him. And we have the same application here today. God has a proper and good and right way that his people ought to serve him. Don't do what's right in your own eyes. Amen. Go to the book. Go to the source and find out for you, yourself, personally. Don't even take my word for it. Take the word of God for truth and say, God, what would you have me to do? Don't do what's right in your eyes. Don't do what's right in my eyes. Don't do what's right in the eyes of any man. For the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And we will always try to do that which is hurtful and sinful and wrong before God. But if we keep ourselves constrained and contained within the context of scriptures, then we can certainly find what God wants us to do. He makes it clear. He lays it out because he doesn't want us to be confounded or confused. Remember, God's not the author of confusion, but he gives us the truth of what he desires for us so that we can simply just trust and obey. He has a way for you, known as the way. <laughs> Don't turn to the right hand or to the left. He has a truth for us, known as the truth. And we're ought to seek after that and long for that. Above all things, we want truth into our lives. We need to be people of truth. That the things that we do, we do them all heartily as unto God. And that's even what that verse continues often. Before the Lord God in all thou, thou puttest thine hand to, we're to rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in all things that God puts before us. And the most joyous way to live your life is the way that God wants you to live your life. So find out what he wants. Get in the book. Hear the scriptures. And then do what God says. 
Seems like Deuteronomy is kind of a repetitive book, doesn't it? He's always just saying, here's the command, just obey it. Here's the command, just obey it. It's repeating for a reason, though, because we're hard-headed sometimes, and we don't just do the simple things that God wants us to do. So he says it again, and again, and again, and again, even as he's showing us in this scriptures. <clears throat> so these things specifically mentioned the tithe of thy corn, wine, oil, firstlings of thy herd, the vows which thou vowest, the freewill offerings which thou offer, the heave offerings of thine own hand. These specific things are religious rites and acts or duties that God commands must not be done in your own gates, but they must be done at the place that he shall choose. Last week we applied that very directly to the church of God, the pillar and ground of the truth. This is the place that God in the New Testament has set forth as the place where all the religious rites start. This is the pillar and ground of the truth. This is the foundation. Not this building in particular, but the assembly, the congregation, us coming together is the place, the habitation of all religious rites, acts, and duties that we ought to do. Verse 19, it continues and says, Take heed to thyself that thou forsake not the Levite as long as thou livest upon the earth. So the purpose of the provision of these heave offerings and free will offerings was that his men, the Levites, who abide in his house would have what they need in order to fulfill their duties. So God makes a place, God places men, and those men have no part nor inheritance, the Bible says earlier in the chapter, amongst the people of Israel. So it was like when he was divvying up the land, he gave a little bit to this tribe, a little bit to that tribe, a little bit to that tribe, and so on and so forth. And when it came to the Levites, he simply said to them, I am your inheritance. Well, how did that work? Well, because the firstlings of the flock we found called out here, God also expected a first fruit of people the firstborn child. Imagine having to give up your firstborn child unto God. God recognized that that was a hard and a harsh thing to ask for. So what he did, instead of saying that the first fruits are mine, in this case, he gave the firstborn son back unto uh, the parents, but required something else instead. And in the time of the Old Testament, instead of taking the firstborn of every family of every tribe, he set aside a whole group unto himself, the Levites. These would be a generation of people, one after another, after another, after another, that would be mine, saith the Lord. He said that the Levites, the first fruits, are mine. Interesting also, though, because he said to those same Levites, and I am yours. I am your inheritance. You're mine, I am yours. And that's a great reciprocal truth. You know that Christ is yours just as much as you are Christ when you're saved? I think we, th we forget about that sometimes. But that's a wonderful truth, that, that, that God is mine. Christ is mine just as much as I am his. He offers himself freely. All I got to do is receive him as a gift and I can have Christ as my leader, as my friend, as my closest companion, as my help in time of need. God offers himself and he can be mine just as much as I can be his. So we continue on in verse 20. It says, When the Lord thy God shall enlarge thy border, as he hath promised thee, and thou shalt say, I will eat flesh, because thy soul longeth to eat flesh. Thou mayest eat flesh, whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. If the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen to put his name there be too far from thee, then thou shalt kill of thy herd and of thy flock which the Lord hath hath given thee, as I have commanded thee, and thou shalt eat in thy gates whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, even as the roebark, as the heart is eaten, so shalt thou eat them, the unclean and the clean shall eat of them alike. Every person has an opportunity to eat flesh whatsoever thy soul lusteth after in their own gates. And there's a few people in this room, a few visitors with us, that maybe their, their ears perked up a little bit when it says, in the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen to put his name there, be too far from thee. If it's just too far, if it's just too inconvenient to go there every time to slay your beast and offer, to go every time and to give of your gifts. God gives provision that you can supply what is needed for your own self, as far as eating meat goes, in your own gates, at your own place, in your own house, he provides that for you and doesn't set that challenge before you like, hey, 
The only time, if you're going to eat meat, it better be in my place. And you have to travel hours upon hours upon hours upon hours to get there. God is reasonable. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He says, behold, my burden is easy. My yoke is light. God isn't this slave driver like we faced in Egypt. No, no. God wants us to rejoice in serving him. And so he doesn't make it so hard and too hard and so difficult and so challenging and so time-consuming that it just drains us. No, no, no. God wants us to get, whether we live far from the place he has chosen or whether we're right by the place he has chosen, he wants to make it so that we can serve God and meet with God's people and perform the religious rites according to his law with ease. He doesn't want to challenge us. He doesn't want to bog us down too much. And so often, yeah, you find with the people of Israel, it was a great challenge. Now, we have cars with air conditioning. It's a lot easier for us to get in, though I admit that it is a challenge, especially with the distances that you two have come. Nevertheless, it's a lot easier than if you were to pack all the children on some sort of drawn animal and, and you're, you're, you're caring for the beast and you're just going over these roads that weren't even roads but paths. And, you know, the struggle that would have gone on back in the day, the great challenge to, to travel to the place where God hath chosen just for a simple meal. <laughs> it's a long place. I'm humbled that you've come here for a simple spiritual meal. I'm blessed by that, certainly, and I hope you are the same. But nevertheless, God admits, I admit, you can admit to yourself, sometimes it's just a little bit too far. Nevertheless, you must eat, right? Nevertheless, the children want a slain beast. Nevertheless, your soul is grumbling after. You want and desire that meat, right? So God makes it available to you. How does he do that? We pray often, give us this day our daily bread. And you know what? That's a twofold um picture there either it is yeah absolutely god provide for me meal provide for me food and sustenance that i can get through my days physically but also what about the bible god provide for me daily bread from your word christ said i am the word he also said i'm the bread of life and so we need daily provision of christ from christ he belongs to you take hold of that and receive it but don't be afraid to ask god to keep providing and keep providing that of the same so you got to eat too far to challenge to travel too challenging to get there sometimes well god provides that you can eat at home especially in the nation that we live in i mean we can we can we can print these off just one after another can't we we can all have a bible we can go down to the dollar store and pick one up for ourselves we can, we can go and find one that we like and, and, and spend a little bit more money on it if we need to, right? But nevertheless, the Word of God is plentiful here. And yet there's an absence of the actual hearing and receiving of it. See, sometimes people, I think, get a little bit um, one-sided on these things. Either, either they're just going to forsake the assembly altogether and then sit at home and be like, you know what, I'm only going to read the Bible. I don't need that any man teach me. I can just get word and me directly from God. And they shun the assembly. And then some people, it's the opposite. They're always in church. They're there. They're hearing the word and getting the meat directly from the place that God hath chosen. And then when they go home, it's just nothing. They're going to watch YouTube or just, you know, this Bible. They open it in, when the preacher says, open to this verse, and then when he says, all right, I'm closing my Bible, I'm done, they close it, and that's the last time it'll crack, right? That's it for the rest of the week until Sunday rolls around again. God here is providing us a picture in Deuteronomy chapter 12 whereby he wants you to get both. He wants us to get what our soul longeth for, what our soul lusteth after. And what is that? That's the word of God. You want that word of God. You desire that word of God. If you're born again, the spirit in you desires more and more and more and more. It's just craving that word. Now, if you're going to decide for yourself that the only place you're ever going to get that is the place that God hath chosen, the meeting house, the congregation, hey, then you're going to starve the rest of the week. I understand it's too far. Maybe services aren't even happening from Sunday to Sunday. We have a Thursday, and that's a blessing for sure. But sometimes people just live off of one meal a week passes they have another meal a week passes they have another meal and a week passes no god says slay in your gates god says get meat in your gates at your home i know it's too convenient i know sometimes maybe the temple's not even open you know so to speak god wants us to not always just eat the meat 
in the holy place. He doesn't want us to just always eat the meat in the place that he has chosen. He wants you personally, individually, to when you're away from it, when it's too far from me. Think about it. I mean, I only live an hour from church, but if every time I needed to go to the place that the Lord hath chosen, you think I'd have any desire to get up in the morning, drive an hour this way, sit in this room, the place, right? Read my Bible, then get up, get back in, drive home and start my day. That would never happen. Even if you live a half an hour, even if you live five minutes from here, you're going to put it off. So God says, slay it in your gates. God says, get your meat in your gates. Provide for yourself in your own gates. But don't forget about the place that he has chosen. That's the place where God wants you to come and to do things that a clean person ought to. Be prepared when thou come to the house of God. We're going to talk a little bit more of that in in the second part. That's what God wants for you. Get your own meat, but also prepare your heart for when you can go and get it in the place that he hath chosen. Understood that for some people it's way more inconvenient than others. It's way more difficult and challenging for others, but hey, maybe that's all the more motivation to get more food at home and look forward to and desire the time when you get to go where God chose. Be clean, be ready at such a time. We'll continue on in Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 23. It says, Only be sure that thou eat not the blood. For the blood is the life, and thou mayest not eat the life with the flesh. Thou shalt not eat it, thou shalt pour it upon the earth as water. Thou shalt not eat it, that it may go well with thee, and with thy children after thee, when thou shalt do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. I think he said it there three times. Be sure that thou eat not the blood. Thou shalt not eat it. Thou shalt not eat it. And then he finishes verse 25 with, thou shalt do what is right in the sight of the Lord. In other words, eating of the blood is absolutely not right in the sight of the Lord in the context here. He says, the blood is in the life, or the blood is the life thereof. Don't eat of it. Don't eat of it. There's a stipulation and care that remains upon those eating in their gates even though they're not doing things according to the you-must-be-clean temple mandates. You see what we're seeing here? God has a church. God had a temple and service there that was decent and in order. There was an order to service. There was a way that they did things. Okay? One of those things was don't eat the blood. Now you're going to eat at home... But does it mean at this point you're just like, ah, whatever, I can eat the blood, I can do it how I want, I can... No, God is actually transcending that there is still to be an order there. So what does that mean? Well, maybe you have a place when you read your Bible that you go to and you sit down. Maybe you have a specific time that you go and you, you know, get your meat from God. Maybe, maybe there's a specific Bible that you like to read. Maybe you like to sing and then pray and then read your Bible and then sing another song. God's just outlining, I believe, by type, that there should also be an order to what you do at home. It shouldn't just be willy-nilly. It shouldn't just be what's ever right in my own eyes. But no, even when you're at home, God still expects you to not eat the life but pour it out as if it were water. And the same thing is done at the temple with a little bit different picture. Do what is right in the sight of the Lord, even when you're not in the sight of the people in the place that he chooses, when you're not in the midst of the congregation. Still do right. The stipulation remains. Pour out the blood. Don't eat it. Thou mayest not eat the life with the flesh. Life and flesh almost never mix. Go to John. Keep your finger in Deuteronomy there. Life and flesh nearly never mix. John chapter 6. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in the New Testament. And that's a, a saying that Jesus made in the Old Testament through Moses, but he made it again in the New Testament, and it was one that caused great offense to those that I believe would have had it that they ate the life with the flesh. They tried to eat the life with the flesh. John chapter 6 and verse 53, look at this. And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. 
For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? And many of his disciples were of the religious Jews, and they knew that the blood was not to be eaten. They knew that the blood was to be poured out or offered upon the altar. So they're like, Why is this teacher who says he's of Christ, or says he's of God, why is he now telling me to eat the flesh and to drink my blood? We know that whenever we eat the flesh, we pour out the blood. We don't mix the two together. Because Christ is giving them a spiritual lesson here, and they're missing it, of course. Why? Because in him challenging them and commanding them to eat his flesh and drink his blood, they're thinking about carnal flesh and carnal blood, which are always separate. We always pour out the blood, then we eat the flesh. What's the problem here? The problem is they're thinking with their flesh. And so they've mixed the whole spiritual truth up. Continues on in verse 60. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Watch this. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. They are life. When he says that he's offering the life, the blood, he's not talking about the carnal blood that is life in a beast. No, he's saying, think about this thing spiritually. Something has changed now. We're now talking spiritual, and everybody there is trying to mix their flesh with the life that they're receiving. And the things of the Spirit are spiritually discerned. And so we can't do that. We can't expect to understand Bible if we're thinking with our flesh. If we're thinking in a carnal mindset, we need to understand the Bible when we're in a spiritual position, spiritually seeking after God's word. And that's what he's trying to say here. Thou mayest not eat the life with the flesh. You got to eat the life with the spirit. And that's what Jesus said and is trying to explain unto them, but they're just not getting it. Verse 64, but there are some of you that believe not. And that's clear. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man could come unto me except it were given him of the Father. In other words, it needs to be something that is spiritually discerned or you're just not going to get it. We don't eat life with the flesh, but we eat the blood. We eat the meat with the spirit that God has given us. Spirit-filled believers then ought to be getting their own spiritual meat within their own gates, but you got to be mindful of the mindset that you're in when you do so. Because if you're at home reading your Bible, sometimes we get a little bit too fleshly in our Bible reading. Do you not notice that there's something to getting up purposely going to the congregation maybe before you do you dress a little bit nicer you do your hair a little bit more you prepare your heart as you go to church as you go to the congregation you're ready to hear what's coming from the preaching of the word of god but when we're at home what do we do i don't know we got the phone still on and and you know we're reading while we're making our coffee and the kids are distracting us there's just a lot going on we are not setting aside and following after the same routine or the same uh, level of, of, what would the word be? Just, just the level of, of, of living right, doing right, following right. We're not getting our mind in a spiritual framework before we try to do a spiritual thing. And it, it'll often just cause you to fail. So if you're going to eat in your gates, still pour the blood out. Okay? If you're going to eat in the gates, keep a routine to it. Be ready to hear. Be spiritually prepared to hear what God has for you. The best thing to do is have your time, especially the guys, early in the morning. I know sometimes sometimes the moms and the ladies get tired because they pretty much get to bed as soon as the kids do, and they're up as soon as the kids are, and, and they don't have enough sleep in that window there. But the guys, sometimes we get an opportunity to go to bed at a certain time and to get up at a certain time. I would challenge you. If you're going to go and get your meat in your own gate, at your own house, you're going to get word of God in you. You're going to eat that meat. Hey, 
get up a half an hour earlier, an hour earlier. Set that time in the morning where you're just gonna be up, fresh, clean, ready. You know, not an unclean person at the end of the day, right? But try to be clean, try to be prepared. Certainly the unclean, the Bible says, have opportunity to kill and to slay in their own gates, right? But try to set aside a time when you can be prepared, spiritually ready, spiritually refreshed. Get in the Word of God then. No distractions. Turn the phone off. Leave it aside. Set a timer if you have to. Certainly your day has to start at some time. You can't tell your boss, sorry, I got in the Spirit and was in the Bible for three hours and expect him to not fire you for it. But nevertheless, have a time set aside just for God and just as you would do when you get ready, travel, come to the house of God, the place that the Lord has chosen, chose, choose a place with God where you're going to set aside a time to go and to meet with Him and to hear from His Word. And He'll bless you for it, certainly. I believe that. Back in Deuteronomy, chapter 12, verse 26 starts. So He's just described how you ought to eat at home, prepare the meat at home. He gave you provision to do so knowing that sometimes getting to the place that he has chosen is too far, too hard, too inconvenient to do on a regular basis. Verse 26 continues, Only the holy things which thou hast, and thy vows thou shalt take, and go unto the place which the Lord shall choose. The holy things, the separate things, the distinct things. In other words, God's saying what you do in the gates... And what is happening here are two different things. There are the holy things, the vows. These you take to the place which the Lord God hath chosen. Do you know what that's telling me? That just because you're always eating in the gates, it doesn't excuse you from the holy things, from the things that are separate, from coming and being, being separated and distinct at a specific time. So God says, what do you do with these? He says, bring them. And it is certainly a good thing that God repeats himself because we saw the same verse basically in verse 6 and in verse 11. Go to the separated place at a frequency fitting, at a frequency perhaps you've decided on with the Lord, committed yourself to. Get to that separated place and there you shall fulfill your vows. There you shall bring the holy things that you would offer unto God. Verse 27, it says, Thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, the flesh and the blood, upon the altar of the Lord thy God, and the blood of thy sacrifices shall be poured out upon the altar of the Lord thy God, and thou shalt eat the flesh. Now here the flesh is eaten. The blood is offered on the altar. It's a little bit different, isn't it? There's a, there's a little bit of a higher thing. Not everybody has an altar in their own house. Not everybody has these holy things in their own place. Certainly God set his name there and decided that they, those furnishings would be provided there for the people. And so, again, that's just a little bit higher of an offering. First, he poured it out like water when he was in his own house. Here, he's, he's pouring it out upon the altar. It's a little bit different. In both cases, you're getting the meat. In both cases, you're getting the sustenance that you require. One requires a little bit more work. One is a little bit more ritualistic in its presentation. That's just a picture of, you know what, when you're at home, you don't necessarily, when you're getting your meat, yeah, you pour out the blood, but you don't necessarily have to put a suit on every time you go. You don't necessarily have to prepare yourself in the same way to offer these things. This is talking about holy things. This is talking about vows which you have made. You bring to the place which God hath chosen, and there you offer. There you give. There, the same thing happens that happened in the first portion. Your whole family comes together. They go to that place and they rejoice. They offer, they sacrifice, and they receive of the meat. All together, that one place that God hath chosen. And this picture looks a little bit like Romans chapter 12 and in verse 1. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. I think some people might have this memorized. I'm going to have to try to find it. Romans chapter 12 and in verse 1 says I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God here the blood is received but there's a higher giving to God that happens. It's a sacrifice. It's you yourself. It's 
going the extra mile to get to the place which God hath chosen. And honestly, these two verses are ones that we should commit to our memory because it's reasonable that we present ourselves. As a Christian, God gave himself for you. It's only reasonable that you give yourself to him. And so whether we are in our gates or whether we are coming to the place that God hath chosen, it all encompasses this sacrifice of your own self which is holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We need to be mindful of that. You're always, every day, giving of yourself unto God, even as Christ gave himself for you. Now, we can go back to Deuteronomy, and I'll wrap up in a few more verses. Deuteronomy chapter 28, sorry, chapter 12, and in verse 28, it says, Observe and hear all these words which I command thee, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee forever, when thou doest that which is good and right in the sight of the Lord thy God. He says, do this. Serve God in that acceptable, reasonable way. Observe and hear these commands that I'm giving you. He's imploring us to follow the way that God hath set before us. He's imploring us to hear the truth and to apply it. He wants us to give. He wants us to do all these things. And it's not, again, just because God is cracking the whip and forcing you to follow after a certain amount of duties just so he can feel better about himself. No, God wants us to do what's right in his sight so that he is right when he blesses us for the same. He says, It will be well with your children and with you after thee. The benefit of doing things God's way is one that is for you, and it's one that will follow after you in the generations to come. I think most of us don't want our children's lives to be worse than the life that we have. We generally want our children's life to be better than our life, and their children to be better than their lives. And we want this constant state of growth in our children's, children's, children's lifestyle. We want them to be more right with God, to be more blessed of God, to be more strengthened in His Word. How, how do we do that? There's no magic formula to it. God is saying it time and time and time again. Observe and hear what I'm commanding you. I got order to this. I have a desire that you would follow and seek after me. I have a way. I have a truth. And the Lord was righteous and good and kind enough to share that with us so that we don't have to walk in darkness. We can just follow the light that he has given us. We'll continue on the last few verses. Verse 29, it says, When the Lord thy God shall cut off the nations from before thee, whither thou goest to possess them, and thou succeedest them and dwellest in their land. Here God is promising that the people certainly will overcome. They're certainly going to enter into these lands and completely rid the lands of the people and the nations that had been ashamed before the living God. He's promising they will be able to overcome. And that's a great blessing for us. If there's a challenge before you, if there's a struggle before you, if, if you have sins in your life you're trying to get rid of, God has already promised you the victory if you simply observe and hear and follow after him. But what we tend to do is what God is now going to warn his people against. Verse 30, Take heed to thyself that thou be not snared. In other words, caught in a trap, tripped up by following them. After that they be destroyed from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their gods, there with a lowercase g, their idols, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Look how easy it would be. They're going to go into a nation where essentially there's no people there to even explain the religion and how they serve their gods to. It seemed like it would be more challenging for them to go out of their way to actually ask such a foolish question as, how do you think they serve their gods? Let's go and do the same. It doesn't even make sense when you have the Lord thy God present with thee. You have God's people. You have God's structure. You have God's way right before you, and he's reiterating it and reiterating it reiterating it. These would have to go really out of their way to serve other gods. But that's the challenge and the struggle. When you're in a nation, a foreign nation, it's so easy for us to get snared, to get trapped, to get tripped up into following after their gods. Look, you are a citizen of the nation of heavenly Israel, if you're born again today. We are strangers and foreigners here in Canada. The temptation will always be there for us to look at our neighbor and say, well, how do they serve their gods? Oh, that seems pretty good. And so we need that separate, holy, 
distinct place that God hath chosen so we can go there and get refreshed and get back on track. This temptation, of course, is going to be much stronger on the people that are living in the fringes. You can go and study it out in the the Old Testament. Quite often, the first people to fall into rebellion and into sin were the ones that lived on the outside of the camp, on the fringes, closest to the nation, closest to the world. Those were the ones that first fell into sin. The ones that were close, nigh unto the place that God hath chosen, it was a hop, skip, and a jump for them to go and to serve God in the holy things and to to get refocused and to hear the word of God and to do and perform the word of God and everybody around them was all going in the same direction. But out on those fringes, if you lived a little bit further, if you lived far away, right, the challenge and the temptation is much stronger on you to look at the world and say, how did they serve their gods? Let's do that. Why? Because it was more convenient for the ones on the fringes to go and to serve other gods than it was to go and to serve the living God. That's the challenge that's before you. So God does say, yes, get your meat in your gates. But hey, there's holy things. You need to be mindful of them. You need to be prepared to go and seek after them, whether it's a vow that you've made that once a month, once a year, once a decade, you're going to go and do the holy things of God in the holy place that he hath chosen. Whatever you've decided upon, be mindful of this fact. Take heed to thyself that you be not snared in the meantime. Acquiring after these nations and seeking after their God simply because you found it more convenient. Verse 31, it says, Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God. And that's what we need to remember. Well, God does remind his people in this chapter to be mindful of the Levites, to be mindful of the servants in the temple, and and to always give of their tithes and their offerings and their heave offerings so that they would be provided for. Ultimately, when men choose to go serve other gods and want nothing to do with the house of God, it's not the servants that have been offended. It's the Lord that's been offended. So let's be more mindful of that. When we decide that we're no longer going to go to church, we're just going to stay home and maybe we'll live stream or maybe we'll have our own little family devotional or whatever we decide. When we decide we're going to get away from the place that God hath chosen, you are not offending the preacher. You're not offending the pastor. You're not offending or hurting the people that are here serving so much as you are doing so unto the Lord your God. For every abomination to the Lord which he hateth have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire unto their gods. And by type, honestly, we can apply that. Children are sacrificed on the altar of convenience all the time. Whether it's actually down in the Planned Parenthood or whether it's in the homes of families that say they love their children. And yet instead of going and doing things according to the way of God, we have some other way. I'm guilty of it myself. Sometimes it's more convenient for me to just pass my son the tablet so that I can go and do something, right? Sometimes that's more convenient. And in doing so, am I offering my son unto other gods? Am I offering him upon the fire? Am I, am I giving him over to the world that's just waiting there to coerce him? Certainly. We have to be mindful of these things. We have to be prepared unto service of God. And we have to be aware, yes, slay in your gates. But there's an ordered place that God also has for us. And he does it for our good, but not just us. God didn't set Deuteronomy 12 forward and all the commands that are about to follow just for his own good. He did it for us, yes, but also for the generations to come, that they would be blessed in our obedience and learn to observe to do the same thing. Look at verse 32 to finalize it. What things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. God says don't ask after the manners. Don't ask after how they do things. Maybe I can add a little bit of how the world worships, right? I can pull the drum kit out. We can get that going, right? The world does that. Maybe that'll spice things up a little bit. No, we don't need to add unto anything that God has. What is, the assemb- what is the congregation? It's the assembly. We added it just this Thursday. We didn't have the usual structure. We just met and we fellowshiped, and that was wonderful. That was a blessing, right? We don't need to add or diminish from the congregation and what it is. We have an order. We follow after that. Certainly it works. But God here is bringing it all into the final statement that he just wants to make regarding what he said. 
There is a temple. There is a set place that he will choose where we all come. The furnishings are prepared. We can do the religious duties. The men are there prepared to serve God with you and to go through the Levitical order of things as you bring your offering and your sacrifice. That will all be prepared and ready for you in that purposed, chosen place. But you also got to get things in your home. You got to do the same service to God in your home. Pour out the blood as you would if you were at the temple. Have an order to things. Have a set time for things. Have have a, the right spiritual heart in these things so that you can benefit your children after. And honestly, you don't need to add anything to it. It's simple. It's got to be a, just a simple, basic serving God. Because again, he's not a slave driver. He's not trying to get you to do some hard and difficult thing. Just do what is decent orderly just just do what's reasonable is what god challenges don't add to it don't take from it it's sufficient what god has given us by instruction in the bible thank you lord for